Okay, we are live. Thank you everyone for joining us for our Free the Press discussion tonight. I'm sure um, we may have lost some of our live audience to the sunshine now that the pub gardens are open, but that's okay. Um, we're here with you till eight. Please do put your questions for our brilliant panelists in the comment section of wherever you're watching and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, where to start? There is so much that we could cover here if only we had all night. It seems to me that every day, sometimes multiple times a day, there's a new story being talked about that has its tendrils going back to the, the mainstream media and the billionaire press. A press captured by the interests of a tiny handful of politically ambitious people because in fact, just three companies control 90% of the national newspaper market. To take just a few examples, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure you wouldn't have missed it, the whole country was talking about the tabloids treatment of Meghan Markle and Harry. This week, we've had the long awaited report into Daniel Morgan's murder, which is expected to incriminate News UK thwarted at the last minute by Priti Patel. And of course, here at Extinction Rebellion, we find ourselves embroiled in a Murdoch Patel mystery of our own, as it's been exposed this week in court that the Home Secretary personally intervened the night of our protest last year. The judges adjourned the case while further evidence of communications between News UK, Pretty Patel and the police can be provided. Meanwhile, we continue hurtling past 1.5 degrees. The government does nothing about it. The so-called fourth estate meant to hold them to account is not only nowhere to be found, but is actually complicit. The billionaire press actively work to keep us divided, spreading hate and misinformation to sell more papers and clicks. And when we consider on top of that, we're looking down the barrel of climate collapse. It's more important than ever that we find a way to come together and take the power out of their lies. So the issues we're discussing here tonight could not be more pertinent, more urgent, or more varied. And I'm so excited to be joined by three brilliant guests to share their unique perspectives on the situation we find ourselves in and how the hell we're gonna get out of it. So we've got with us tonight, uh, Marvina Newton, a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Leeds and the founder of United for Black Lives. We've got uh, Natalie Fenton, a professor at Goldsmiths University London and the chair of the Fantastic Media Reform Coalition. And we've also got Jane Fay from the organization Trans Media Watch. Um, if you're wondering where Kerry Ann of the Canary is, she sent her apologies earlier today and is sadly not able to join our discussion, but she's with us in spirit. So thank you all so much, Marvina, Natalie and Jane for spending your Thursday evening with us. First, we're going to go to each of you for your opening thoughts and then we'll broaden it out for questions from our viewers. Um, Natalie, would you would you mind kicking us off? Thank you. Um, thanks, Golly, and thanks for putting on this event and the invite to talk. I want to focus my opening remarks around the issue of power and influence, because I think that's really what we're talking about. And as you remarked, um, that research that was done by the Media Reform Coalition that showed that only three companies own 90% of news circulation and that DMG Media, who own Daily Mail, Sunday Mail, Metro and the I News UK, who own The Sun, The Times and their Sunday equivalents and Reach, who own Mirror Express, Star Titles and um, The Sunday People. Now those three companies dominate 90% of the national newspaper market. If you include online readers, because we often get the comment, oh, but it doesn't really matter online, every, anyone can read whatever they like. But when you include online readers in that calculation, the same three companies still dominate 80% of the market. And that gives them enormous power to set the agenda of our national public conversation. And um, Rupert Murdoch famously said when he was asked about um, his position on Europe and, and why he wanted to leave the EU, he said, it's simple. When I go to Brussels, they don't listen to me. And when I go to the UK government, they do what I say. Uh, it was a very clear indication of the kind of inroads he has into not just what the government do, but our policy making process more generally. 
In evidence to a House of Lords Select Committee back in 2007, Rupert Murdoch said he simply acted like what he called a traditional proprietor in regard then to the son of the news of the world. He said he didn't interfere except on major issues such as which party to back in a general election or policy on Europe. And I'll come back later to talk about his um, views also on climate change. That sort of media concentration creates conditions in which wealthy individuals amass enormous social and political power. If we think back, we've got real examples of this kind of through concrete anecdotes. Back in 2015, when we were looking at a new general election there, the independent newspaper reported that Rupert Murdoch told journalists at The Sun that if Ed Miliband got into power, then the future of the company was at stake. And he directed them to be more aggressive in their attacks against Labour and more positive against the Conservative Party. British newspapers, as we well know, were overwhelmingly in favour of Brexit, with the Mail, Telegraph, Express and Star accounting for four times as many readers and anti-EU stories as their pro-Remain rivals. A study from Loughborough University noted that when circulation was taken into account, 18% of media coverage was pro in the EU and 82% was pro out. So it's not just the sorts of information we get to read, this sort of concentration kind of gives media owners enormous influence over politics itself. And if you cast your mind back to the Leveson inquiry, you know, an 18 month inquiry into culture practice and ethics of the press, four successive prime ministers gave evidence to that inquiry, admitting that they were too close to the big media players because the political stakes were so very high. And we heard at that inquiry how Rebecca Brooks, who was then editor of the News of the World, was best mates with David Cameron. And during the Levis inquiry, it was revealed that a member of the cabinet had met executives from Murdoch's empire once every three days on average since that coalition government had been formed. The inquiry also heard that on the day before David Cameron addressed the Conservative Party conference, he got a text message from Rebecca Brooks that was, you know, was cringeable actually in its coziness. And she said, seriously, I do understand the issue with the Times. Let's discuss over a country supper soon. She ends by saying, I'm so rooting for you tomorrow, not just as a proud friend, but because professionally, we're definitely in this together. Speech of your life, yes, he can. And that kind of really um, entanglement, that sort of relationship was seen as indicative of a culture of press politician mutual in interest in which those sorts of media executives, party leaders work together to push a single agenda. And in Cameron's, and that was really in Cameron's words, he used that time to pushing the same agenda. Rupert Murdoch and Donald Trump were great mates. It was rumoured at the time when Trump was elected that he was ringing Murdoch at least once a day. Um, Matt Hancock, in his former role as, um, as Secretary of State for DCMS, bowed down to industry pre pressure to ditch Leveson too. And as Golly pointed out in her opening remarks, Priti Patel, who we should remember is a friend of Murdoch, attended his wedding, his last wedding, and has been accused in Parliament of seeking to block or redact that independent report into the murder of a private detective, Daniel Morgan, as part of a potential cover-up to protect friends in Rupert Murdoch's media empire. So in these sorts of circumstances, you've got political parties, police, other institutions, which become very reluctant to stand up to media corporations to regulate their power or to make them publicly accountable from wrongdoing. So whether it's climate denialism or cheering on alt right wing slogans in the US, hosting coronavirus misinformation globally, it's actually quite hard to imagine a reactionary cause that Murdoch's empire in particular hasn't championed, such as its reach of its kind of propaganda mach machine that even his own son, James Murdoch, left News Corp in 2020, declaring that the Murdoch outlets 
obscured facts and legitimised disinformation, particularly over climate change he was talking about. While the former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, has called the Murdoch empire a cancer to democracy. And in spite of that kind of rampant criminality that was exposed in Murdoch controlled newsrooms on both sides of the Atlantic, News Corp or News UK now continues to enjoy unrivaled access to most senior figures of government. In a report by Hacked Off last year, in their research, they found that Murdoch and his senior executives had met with senior minister and officials over 200 times in just 24 months. Now it's really hard to get access to government in that way. That doesn't come easy, even for the majority of MPs. So that's an incredible amount of privileged access and entitlement to power. In 2018, the Competition and Markets Authority advised that the government advised the government against allowing Murdoch to gain control over Sky News. It cited threats to the public interest over media plurality. Ofcom then acknowledged disturbing evidence of corporate failure within the Murdoch Empire. And yet, as Gully also um, mentioned, I think in the beginning, um, that actually now Murdoch is talking about opening a new news platform. We don't know yet what that will be, but we know he's intending to operate new forms of publish new forms of news content in the UK. It was going to be a TV channel. It's now said to be on digital platforms. So, you know, what we're seeing is actually the construct itself, the framework for media plurality is unfit. It's inadequate and it doesn't support democracy. The previous Tory government actually agreed with this. It endorsed a recommendation by Ofcom and a House of Lords Select Committee to carry out periodic reviews of media plurality to ensure that our news landscape is sufficiently diverse and democratic. Despite multiple um, agreements in the House of Commons that that's the thing that needs to happen, it's never done. It's always kicked into the long grass. And now, of course, it's kicked even further under the cover of the pandemic. And that's why the Media Reform Coalition is calling for Parliament to establish a new commission of inquiry into media ownership. And we want Parliament to act, not the government, pr precisely because we know from recent past just how liable the government is to capture by that Murdoch regime. Um, I, I could go on and on, maybe we'll cover other things in, in the questions, but we should also note, because I think the Pretty Patel incident um, uh, in relation to what's just happened over the XR court case is really telling. And what we see, what that points to is this kind of real, um, kind of um, deeply entangled relationship between media elites and political elites and something of a, revolving door that happens between major news organizations and the government. So you know Boris Johnson worked for the Telegraph and the Times. Michael Gove was a Times journalist. George Osborne became editor of the London Evening Standard. Allegra Stratton became Rishi Sunak's director of communications. She was a friend of Dominic Cummins and was national editor of ITV News and political editor of Newsnight. She then became Downing Press Street secretary. And in April 2021, she became the spokesperson for the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference. So you can see how these, um, the, the, the kind of ways in which power functions in a very kind of in ever increase ever dense i think kind of executive power between media and political elites so you know it's a major problem i'll come on to talking about later just the the ideas within the media reform coalition about how we can change that but i you know fully support the extinction rebellion protests over the concentration of um, media ownership that is distorting democracy on every count, including the coverage of um, climate change. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was brilliant. I, I feel like I've done nothing but think and talk about the press for the past year, but five minutes of you talking and it's like, oh my God, it's all, all new again, which is exactly how it should be. We should be shocked by this because it is shocking, but we've, we've become so insensitized in this country recently with corruption and but, but we have to keep reminding ourselves of of what it means really um thank you so much so marvina um i'd like to pass it to you please thank you 
want to say thank you again, um, XR, Golly, and Natalie. That opening literally was all it needed to be, honestly. Um, funny thing is, mine is about privilege. <laughs> My opening remarks is built around privilege. How, how iconic it is for us to talk about power and also now bring it to privilege. So hi, privilege is something that we don't even work for. It's something that has bestowed on us. And from what you've heard Natalie say, you can see how if the privileged few run the press, whose stories will be told? So now let me paint a picture. Representation matters. Take a moment and let that sit with you. If you are told a lie over and over and over again, it starts to sound like the truth. If you're told a lie around making sure that you see that the environment has no issue and this is all mythical, or you know what, the only representation of black bodies you see are criminals or people that are definitely doing something that you don't do, you start building a stereotype notion of what you think black looks like. When you tell people that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group and you splash it at all the newspapers and you label a group of people fighting for their equal rights, human rights, and now you put on them that they are terrorists. Can you imagine the privilege taken away from them at that point? Access to work, opportunities, they are labeled. So technically in 2021, this is what a terrorist looks like. Me, according to the media. According to the media's narrative of what's written, people that are part of BLM or XR are nuisance. In fact, they decided to create a police and crime bill just for us. And they made sure they plastered it all over the place and said who they wanted to blame, XR and BLM. Two, two right people, and again, they did try and put us against each other, making those two dynamic causes think the other is to blame. Or what they never expected was for us to talk to each other, for us to work with each other, to unpick the lies that they constantly have to say on a daily basis. And this is where we are now. When we say free the press, it's about what lies are the press for me telling to make the other feel different. If we don't talk about what we have in common, the more gap in between how we can celebrate what we have in similarities are never gonna be told. So this is where we talk about decolonizing the press. When you show that only one group of people has contributed to what history is, when you show that only one group of people have created what you know as civilization, you are putting a distorted narrative. Great Britain would not be great without the contribution of multiple, multiple diverse communities. And that's the narrative that needs to be spoken about. Let's talk about the positive deviants who would never get shown in the press. How come every time you see a black man on your newsfeed, it's always something negative and except they play in football, basketball or singing. And even if they do that, there's always another little dig. Think about the experiences of footballers who are black or white. When they buy a house, it's all celebrated in a beautiful way for a white person. But when it becomes a black person, oh, look at that. He just bought this house. If he really cares, this is Marcus. Marcus has gone through a lot, doing a lot for the community, trying to tackle food poverty, but yet the media constantly comes at him, increasing the amount of racial abuse that he gets on social media and offline. These are things the media has a power of creating. And when the people that have the privilege do not consider the voice of those who are marginalized and disadvantaged, what we have is a biased system. And it's not unconscious. And I need us to stop saying it's unconscious. No, it's unconscious effort to erase, to lie, to manipulate and gaslight the majority of the audience who 
honestly believe that what they see in the media is truths. So let's make this really simple. I now know Natalie, and I think Natalie is cool. And this is how privilege works. I have now shared the platform with Jane too. I can then see when I go into another room, I see Natalie and Jane. I would naturally gravitate to these two individuals because I know them. There's that privilege that comes with that experience of sharing a circle with someone. There might be an opportunity for me to ask for someone to speak around the press. And I would then go straight to who I know first, Natalie and Jane, and constantly not try and break out of my echo chamber because the privilege of knowing certain people means I keep to my circle of, that's the medium. The media keeps recycling the same garbage on the same basis based on who they know that fits the narrative of what they need to say to win you over. If they are going to put anything to stare you past, it is a problem. Why would we need to tell the truth when the lie makes more money? Why would we need to show how black excellence looks like when it's easier to make them look like dogs? Why would we need to be able to talk about a beautiful young lady having an unfortunate circumstance this weekend and being shot, but instead they had to make it into black on black crime and gang affiliation, removing the humanity of what she stood for. That's what the press does to our community. To the point that when we report that black activists are getting targeted and being vilified and constantly in threat of their life, again, you're playing a black card you will still struggle to find people as dark as me on your screen. I can count them. And you know you can count them too. Be, being able to see someone melanated with my shade is something that is actually quite striking when you get that opportunity. But we are far between because there's this rule of one in, one out. It works. Get the token black person, tick your box and make sure it looks like you are doing inclusivity. But don't worry, we're not gonna give that person power. We tell them what to say, and if they ruffle the feathers, we know exactly not to give them that place. Meghan Markle was a good example of what the press can do. And we in the black community were thinking, she's not even that dark. She actually can pass for being a lighter skinned woman. She does pass for that and the media tore her apart. I can only imagine, and colorism is right in the media industry. You have to be a certain kind of shade with a certain kind of texture to your hair for your story to be heard. I just wanted to make sure we understand that in my children not seeing reflection of who they are, constantly being perpetrated in a way that is so negative if you're told that you cannot do anything, sorry, if you're told that you cannot do anything great and you don't come from nothing, how can you aspire to be greater? And that's what our communities keep doing. We keep being painted in a light that the media can no longer get away with this. And this is why we're taking part with XR and take, creating this united stand to say we want to free our press because it's the democracy, the people's voices matter. We are stronger when we're together. Let's start on picking all the lies, the lies, surprise, surprise, the lies the press tells. It's constant on a daily basis. And we are gonna work together to make sure your voice, your truth, what matters to you comes to light. And we won't stop. We'll continue to be that nuisance that they say we are annoying and nuisance. Thank you so much. And I hope this gives you, I can't wait to answer some of the questions. I think Natalie covered all the background knowledge that all I could do is paint the picture of it from what it feels like for a black person constantly seeing negative representation of themselves in the media, how that also would obscure their managers, obscure the school teachers, and also cause a breakdown in identity and a sense of belonging in a country that they call their home.
Thank you so much, Marvina. That was great. Um, yeah, great to, to follow on from Natalie as well, who, who was talking about the, the power, the, the centralization of power and what that means, and then to, then to connect it to, to real lives. What does it mean when mm. a few people have such a massive voice, and then it means obviously that other people have no voice? Um, thank you for that. Uh, Jane, we'd love to hear from you next. Ah, good evening. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk about what's going on from a trans perspective. But I think the same lessons we have come across are the same lessons that uh, XR are facing, same lessons that Black Lives Matter are facing. Um, I have put into chat a link, if you don't mind me um, hitting send on it at some point, Gully, uh, which is actually a climate change story that you haven't seen in the press this week. It's incredible because it's quite a big story. I'll ask you that again at the end. Um, from a trans perspective, today I was editing, not editing, I was do, looking at data from a survey, very big survey done of trans people about their lives in the UK right now. Um, in that survey there was a question about had your mental health been impacted by the media? 72% said yes, 72%. And in fact, 15% didn't respond, which could mean anything. So take that out. And close to 85% of those who gave a response said their mental health was being impacted by the media. So it has an effect on things like legislation, on how people perceive um, the law and movements. But it also has a very real impact on people. Um, I think it is very true that for a lot of trans people, the last few years have been absolute hell because of what the press has gone for. Um, an individual who this week is leaving Stonewall tweeted out before they went because they work in a media facing um, capacity that this is the hundred, the day on which they resigned or they're leaving is the 144th day of the year. And already the Times has run 223 articles about trans people, which given that their obsession is mostly with trans women, of which there's about 30,000 across the UK, it's just, we're, we're, we're starting to reach a point where the Times is going to produce one article for every 25 trans women. It's ludicrous. But <clears throat> over the last few years, uh, since 2012, we've seen a tripling or quadrupling in the amount of stuff written about trans people, but it's not balanced. There is no balance whatsoever to it. Um, Transmedia Watch did a survey uh, a couple of years back looking at a selection of articles. We found about two thirds, 70% were hostile. What we then found that Within the hostile articles, a further 70% carried anti-trans comment from anti-trans commentators, and about 40% had positive comment. So, well, that's not a total imbalance. If they're a negative article, you'd expect a negative. But we look more closely, only 5% of the articles carried positive comment from trans people. In other words, we're not even being involved in our own narrative. Um, one in 20 articles justifying or talking about some aspect of trans existence uh, contain anything from a trans person. And the point that Marvin is making about tokenism, I absolutely see uh, there is a couple of I went, well, I might say token trans people whose views are pretty much adults with the vast majority of trans people in the UK. And they soak up an incredible percentage of the total media output. So the media knows what it's doing. Um, during debate about changes to the Gender Recognition Act, which were completely, utterly misrepresented by the press, Again, we did some survey work, and although there was a rough 
balance in terms of absolute numbers of articles because the LGBT press came up for us. If you looked at readership, the anti-trans perspective was being pushed by 10 times as many. Um, um, no, it's not 10 times as many papers. The weight of the anti-trans perspective was 10 times that of the pro. So it's hardly surprising if people don't know what's going on or have a very strange view. Um, certainly the old saw is if someone says it's raining outside, the journalist's job is not to stage debate about whether it's raining, but to look outside the window, whereas what we're seeing today, um, they're not so much staging a debate as phoning up a mate in Scotland and asking what they think about the weather. They're completely detached from the truth, from the very communities who are actually involved in these issues. And I suspect both with Black Lives Matter, I, I, I've had this with one national paper, um, was asked to write something about trans people. And then I was asked to amend my copy and I found a workaround, so I wasn't actually selling out, but I still had to amend. To draw a distinction between ordinary trans people and those damn trans rights activists, because they were evil people and they were doing bad things. And we've seen this with Black Lives Matter, all, all the nice papers say, yeah, we're totally against racism, but it's just those extremists in, in Black Lives Matter. We're totally against climate change, but Extinction Rebellion, well, that's a step too far. You see the way the narrative is moved. And, and yet it's worse than that, because again, we do an awful lot of detailed work. A few weeks back, I came across two very, well, similar in the way they both sat in the crime desk of a particular national newspaper. One was a story in which a trans woman in the UK had been murdered. One was a story in which a trans woman seems to have got involved in a rather ridiculous love triangle um, and uh, then went a bit off the rails and knifed one or both of the others in the love triangle. So in one, a trans woman was there as a murder victim and in the other, a trans woman was there as a perpetrator. What was very interesting Firstly, was the way it was played, if you looked at the text and the pictures and so on. The one where the trans woman was a victim, you had to get seven paragraphs into the piece before you realised she was a trans woman. So that might be one reason people don't realise that violence is enacted upon us. But even worse, and even more subtle, and the geeks will know what this is about, the SEO, the way the articles were tagged, mm -hmm. the one in which the trans woman was a victim, was tagged simply News and London. It was News and she lived in London. The one in which a trans woman was a perpetrator was tagged News and Transgender Issues. Trans people attacking people, that's an issue. Trans people being murdered, that's a London story. I, I mean, it, it, it beggars belief, really. So... I think what we're seeing is certainly the bias at the top level that Natalie is talking about, but at the lower level, there's just a series of appalling tropes and techniques, keeping people out of their own narrative, um, trying to create a division between the good and the bad in every movement, and then treating the mainstream as actually the bad extremists, and just generally using a whole host of verbal and picture tricks to undermine people who are just doing their best to struggle. So I'm going to end there. Um, Gully, if it's okay if I put the link up, it's okay. I don't think it will it will reach our viewers, but if you send it to us, we'll put it up after the after we hang up. We can you share can it. Copy it because it, it's a free link. You don't need to copy it exactly. But I shall send it. Okay. I will copy it. I'll, I'll copy and paste it down. Thank you. Um, we'll show it after this. Thanks so much for that, Jane. Um, we're going to see what questions, sorry, I'm just copying and pasting, uh, what questions we've got. So um, well, I'm wondering if um, we've talked a lot here, especially 
the last two, Marvina and Jane, about um, about the narrative and about um, how that's skewed to to corrupt debate and to corrupt information and, and representation um, and the way we see each other. Um, and um, somebody's asked, do you do you see a difference between print and TV media in terms of peddling hate and setting a specific agenda? As Hannah's asked that. Um, and from my uneducated perception of things, um, they're increasingly indivisible, it seems to me, I, that the newspapers set the agenda for the TV shows. And, and as, as, as the sort of corruption gets, gets more um, hard to pull apart um, and the, the BBC is, is dismantled and Rupert Murdoch moves into the, the, the TV sphere, um, they become increasingly indivisible, but I, I would love to hear what, what you guys think. Does anybody want to come in on that? The, the papers versus the, the broadcasters? I mean, I can kick off if you like. I think it's, I mean, the, I think there is a difference in certain ways in terms of the news, and that's partly to do with the way they're regulated. Uh, the regulation of newspapers goes via, um, of all our national newspapers, goes via an organisation called IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organisation, which is anything but independent. It was the replacement organisation for um, the failed Press Complaints Commission. And again, we're to, we were talking about revolving doors earlier. This was exactly the same. They literally changed the plaque on the front door. It's more or less the same people. It's the people who run the industry who are kind of marking their own homework and regulating themselves. They, in when we're talking about discriminatory coverage, uh, they go by uh, the journalist code of conduct. And within that um, code, you can't complain about groups of people being discriminated against. So you can't complain about trans people or black people or women or travelers. You can only complain if you are a named individual in that um, piece. So that means, in, and this came from the um, um, Alan Moses, who was the chair of IPSO at the time, in one year they had 8,148 discrimination complaints. Only one was upheld because of that particular code of conduct. If you go into um, the way the broadcasting is regulated, it's slightly different. You've got Ofcom and Ofcom, mm -hmm. um, you have to, but in order to get a complaint Accepted by Ofcom, you first have to go through um, whichever news organization's complaint system exists and that you're complaining to. So if it was the BBC, you have to go through the BBC complaint system before you get to Ofcom. It's a very long winded process. It requires lots of endurance and hardly anything gets there. So, again, you know, you you uh, you end up in a situation where people complain directly to Ofcom because they don't understand the process and it's just thrown out. So very few complaints are upheld. So it's um, but um, at, at least Ofcom does monitor certain things <laughs> over time in a way that Ipso doesn't at all. So you do get a slight difference. But if you come to things like um, climate change, it wasn't really, you know, the BBC in particular, or broadcasting in particular, has been really bad about climate change. It wasn't until 2018, actually, that we got any real shifts in how they were reporting. And that was, um, and they sent round a sheet around the BBC. This was looking, I think, back in September 2018, I've got my notes here, uh, for editorial policy and position on climate change. They were, BBC staff were invited to sign up for a one hour training course on reporting on climate change. And that was following an, a, a ruling that had come earlier in the year by Ofcom, which found that BBC Radio 4's flagship current affairs programme today had breached the broadcasting rules by not sufficiently challenging Lord Lawson, who was a former Conservative Chancellor, who chaired a UK-based climate sceptic lobby group and had made false claims about climate change in an interview on Today and hadn't been challenged. So, you know, the BBC then apologised for breaching its editorial guidance. Um, but that, you know, had been facing repeated criticism over false balance on the whole idea of climate change. Oh, well, if we show climate change is happening, we've got to show a climate change denier, which was just this nonsense of false equivalence when 
all of the science, everything is saying that's ridiculous and a nonsense. So, you know, the, the, the impartiality rules that the BBC abide by can end up in this weird false equivalence situation where actually what you're not doing is accounting for um, truth <laughs> in a particular situation or you're not accounting duly for context which I think is often the case when you come to reporting on um, other things like immigration for example or you know you're not given that global context about how immigration is a consequence of massive climate change and a consequence of the UK's role in wars overseas. So you're not getting any of that detail come through. And so what people in the UK think is, oh, we've got more immigrants coming over here, stealing our jobs and bleeding the NHS dry, because that's what the newspapers are telling them. So, you know, it's a complex picture, but it's not that, um, you know, there are differences between the way broadcast and press manage it. Both are guilty to certain degrees. Thanks, um, Natalie. Yeah, go on, Jane. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, they're different in the detail. Uh, the print press perhaps owes more to the biases of the people at the top, although, of course, there are vast tracts of it where journalists roam free. Um, but the BBC is every bit as bad. Uh, in a different way, there are enclaves that we find where journalists decide that they know what the truth is and then they pursue that particular version of the truth uh, to the exclusion of all else. And yes, there is this very British hypocritical, oh, we're doing decent things and we've got codes, we're regulated by codes. So because we're regulated by codes, nothing can possibly be going wrong. Um, what we have found out, because we have complained about those things, firstly that both Ipso and Ofcom have sort of brought themselves round to a position where accuracy per se, because that's the one area where you can complain, um, almost everything else, you're right, uh, it's all about the individual. It's really the Ipso and the press codes are there to prevent libel suits, because that's what happens in English law if you're really rude about a person, as we saw in the news today, uh, you can be hit with a very, very big libel suit. And so the press put the individual qualifications into the media code so that uh, they can field libel at the first hurdle. And there's nothing in there about groups, so you can go into the press and say what you want about travellers, as long as you're not directly inciting violence. You can tell what you want about travellers or Muslims or trans people as a collective, as a group, and you can incite as much hate as you pretty much want. Um, the codes have certainly come round to saying on the accuracy front now, that so long as it's what the public think is the truth, then it wouldn't necessarily be inaccurate to describe the thing in that way. Now, do think about that. What they have actually said, and Natalie, if you weren't aware of this, I'm sure you are, but if you weren't, I've got the rulings. They have actually come back to individuals uh, on our team who have complained and <coughs> said, no, there's uh, what we reported may not have been actually what was said or what was done, but the public would imagine people like this to have said things like this. That's incredible. It means that they've given themselves a clean bill for uh, making up quotes. Um, as regards um, BBC versus uh, media, I mean, this whole idea of balance, as you say, it's complete false equivalence. Um, we would get trans people who have spent 10 years dealing with trans healthcare stuck in the studio against someone who hasn't a clue about it, asking those ridiculous questions. And <clears throat> Yet the battle then becomes who speaks better. Uh, and the BBC says, oh, there has to be balance, but that's not true. They put in balance when they feel like it. And again, we had two instances recently, coverage of a particular legal case where an individual, I 
think it may still be some juicy, so I'm not going to go into any great detail, but they wanted the right to talk to people however they felt like at work, um, including being directly offensive to their face, which you think most employers wouldn't want around the building. And that piece had a lot of comment from them, from their lawyer, and from people supportive of them. And because it was about trans stuff, it was effectively a fairly anti-trans piece with four people speaking up in favour of the anti-trans case. No pro-trans balance, there may be one comment or one versus four. Whereas when the parliamentary LGBT forum um, had a go at Liz Truss for her views on trans people, there was insistence that there should be balance in there, which is strange because that sort of news story wouldn't normally have balance because it's a straight news story. So what happens is the BBC and the wider press cite balance when they want to, when it suits them, and when they don't want to, they've got all sorts of reasons why balance can't be there. Thank you, Jane. Um, that was great. So I, I want to move us on to talking a bit about solutions, but first um, I'd like to give Marvina some um, space to, to just go into a bit more depth of the things that you touched on in your um, opening comments. And a couple of people have, have been talking about it in the chat. So um, I know Carrie Ann's not here, but I'm going to be a bit cheeky because I, when I was swatting up for tonight, I found a really good quote from her. I would just love to get your reaction to and see if see what you think about it. So um, I'm just going to read it out and see what you think. Um, so she says that race has been weaponized in service of capitalism as a means of taking an opposition in the form of the working class and dividing it into competing factions to convince them all that the only chance they have of improving their personal conditions is at the expense of someone else. Um, I, that just rang so true for me in thinking about the, the press. And I just wonder if that chimes with, with your perception and if you have any thoughts on that. I feel like she just came into my mind and took her thoughts and just put it in words. And I think um, the weaponization of race, I, I'm, I think the media has done so well in keeping racism alive. It's a business to keep it alive. It's a business. And we need to be able to call it out for it. The dehumanization de de of people, the making um, ostracization and like constantly picking out the flaws in people, making them feel that you're not seen. In fact, you're not important, you're irrelevant. And even if you then do get some amazing young people who wanna go into the media, the torture of even being in that machine is enough to make you leave. Mentally and emotionally, let's talk about the stats of the fact that media, whether written or press or on TV or whatever, has always, always had a racist undertone belly to it. I remember saying something, where I was teaching my daughter about light, and she said, Mommy, how weird is it that um, Black absorbs light and keeps the heat. Is that why we are full of fire? And I was like, how nice she thought about that. She goes, I said that in school and my teacher said that sounded a little bit violent. And I paused and looking at a 10 year old, I started going through the scenarios in my head of trying to empathize with that teacher trying to decolonize where that information would have come from, trying to understand what would have got to this point. And then I realized at that moment, I was gaslighting myself based on narratives of how I'm about to react and how the media was gonna pick it. I have to do that every day. Every day before I react to something, when I'm hurt, when someone does something to me, I have to think, are you going to push the angry black woman's narrative? No, Marvina, you're going to code switch now. You're going to make sure you have your white sounding voice. You're going to make sure you don't have your fur out. You're going to make sure you do not do anything 
that the media has said you are. Imagine if you do that every day. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're thinking about what other people have created a narrative for you. And no matter what you do throughout the day, you're going to be living the media's narratives of who you are. We talk about climate all the time. Climate justice is something that we need to talk more about. Climate refugees are something Natalie kind of alluded on. I'm Nigerian and I'm proud of it. But when I think about Nigeria and what the environment looks right now, I can show that, tell you that the media does not tell you what Shell is doing to my country, what the empire has done to my country, why still we are getting funded by the military of defense who is funding SARS. That's facts. But you're not going to see that written in any articles, are you? And SARS campaign came and went. We talk about Black Lives Matter uprising and you had diversity do your dance and they got reported. But the amount of racist undertone we see on the news, on TV, in cartoons, sly true. And no one is held accountable because guess what? We don't have the pen to write our own narrative. We don't have the resources to write our own narratives. And when we do have our own newspapers, our own TV stations, it is always scrutinized by the other. It becomes such a toxic field of who gets the money, the person that knows how to speak the language going back to privilege. And then people will be like, I'm not privileged. I've been through this and that. Just, I beg you to wear my skin for a day. And let's try and say, privilege you didn't work for, your skin tone gives you an advantage to see things around you that looks like you, to be treated in a different way, to be spoken to in a different way. A black boy wears a hoodie and a white boy wears a hoodie. Yes, some people say he might be called a chav, but the black boy might be called a thug. The black boy would get stopped and searched. The black boy might end up being arrested. The black boy might get killed in the process. That's facts. When you take that to the trans community, the black trans community, you don't want to see anything written about them. The only time you hear anything around black trans people is either when they're murdered or they committed a crime, or if they're just doing something extraordinary. There's no in between about the everyday black trans person. Why would that make the news? Or black LGBT community, black women doing great things, not being angry. Wow. Wouldn't that be a news piece? But we apparently don't exist. So there will be no narrative about that because you can only be Beyonce or you could be something, you could be Serena Williams. Everybody in the middle, forget about you <laughs> because that narrative does not sell papers. So for me, yes, racism, race has been weaponized to fit into a capitalist culture the only times you see black people represented is if we want to sell something to black people. So we'll put some black people in the modeling piece in a tokenized way, dressed up, labeled up. And when it's to do with climate, you just don't see us really that much. There might be one or two, but no one wants to hear from that angle as much. So we need to start making sure we show the full scope of what it is the media and capitalist and consumption <laughs> culture is doing to us, but it's a hard, it's a hard time. It is a hard time. Thank you, Marvina, for that. Um, okay, so we've got an eye on the time. We've got a few minutes left. It would be great to just get some final comments from people, and if we could look, it'd be great if we could look ahead to, to what what we can. Do about this and what the students are. Lots of people are mentioning it in the chat. Um, somebody said, Who's this? This is Anna. I'm Roma. This has gone on all my 58 years and beyond. What can we do except talk about it? Somebody said, Amy said, I'm studying journalism at uni. Our education is already very narrow and out of touch. What can I do? Um, so I'd just like to pass it to everybody in turn for a couple of minutes to, to speak to what 
what are we going to do? I'm going to suggest what I think we should do. Obviously, you can expect. Um, but Natalie, it would be great, great to hear more about um, the Parliamentary Commission that you're calling for in media reform than the XR definitely supports. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to do lots of things on different levels, actually. I mean, that kind of deep entanglement of media power and political power I was talking about is kind of self-serving. The government favours large corporate media because they're dominant. They retain their dominance because the government favours them. And, um, you know, absolutely right. This is all uh, to do with capitalism and making lots of money. Um, and the concentration of media ownership keeps that relationship intact. So we have to get to a point where we can legislate for more and better media plurality to create a different communications environment that is more diverse and fully independent of vested interests, whether they're commercial vested interests or political vested interests. I think we also need to do something at the other end though. So that's kind of, you know, I, I think of these, these three massive companies as a bit like a massive oil slick that kind of blocks out all other voices coming through. And what we need to do is encourage also from the ground up, from the grassroots up, alternative models of media ownership that aren't caught with it or captured by capitalism. So we need new sorts of stru media structures, which are co-ops, which are employee buyouts that promote equality and financial security of journalists over shareholder returns and serve a much wider range of needs are located in communities and serve diverse interests and work with communities crucially. And I think we also need a much more democratic, diverse and accountable public service broadcasting. You know, over the last three decades, the independence of the BBC has been steadily eroded. Its programme making has become increasingly commercialised. And in recent years, its funding has been severely cut and its programming more conservative. Now, I think, you know, we need public service media. It is vital to our media ecology because it isn't driven solely by profit and that does make a massive difference but it's got to be reformed in big ways in order to make it more democratized and to operate autonomously of government and market that requires real independence from government it can't decide on the funding settlement for the bbc because that means the bbc is going to ever be in kind of in debt and, and watching what the government is going to say about its next funding settlement. So that has to change completely. And I think we need to have a um, Leveson compliance system of regulation over the press as well. I mean, you know, we can't have this thing called freedom of the press which is clearly freedom of the powerful to abuse the powerless, um, unless we've got freedom of the public to assess and challenge that nature of communication. We have to have freedom that's kind of shared, not power that's abused. And, and to do that, we do need a system of regulation. We've got um, an organization called Impress, which is regulated um, under the Royal Charter framework, but none of the major news publishers signed up to it, newspaper publishers. So, you know, it's got a whole heap of wonderful independent media. And if Kerry Ann Mendoza was here, she'd be singing the praises of the Canary. And I would say to everybody, support independent media um, and because they're trying to do something very different. So the likes of Navarra, the likes of Canary and the likes of Declassified, which investigates um, UK foreign policy. You know, these are fantastic news sites that are doing independent journalism of integrity, which is or, or is trying at every stage to be anti-discriminatory. It's not just, you know, performing journalism to get clickbait. It's trying to do good journalism. So, you know, a, a few suggestions at all levels. There are things we can do. Thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah, lots of um, solutions outlined there that we can be looking towards. Jane, do you have any closing comments for us? <laughs> Try and keep it very short. Um, I agree utterly with what Natalie's saying. And... Marvina, in different ways, is describing a trans experience as well as um, her own experience. Similar but different perspective. What I see going on out there is people with privilege. That they they, they um, tone police the whole time. Um, there's a lot of people who have very good reason to be very angry with those in power with those who have brought us to where we are right now. But anger is somehow or other regarded as 
bad, you, are, you become evil the moment you show anger. And to uh, talk about the intersection, yes, um, black trans people have it incredibly hard. And, uh, if, if people are not aware of it, go and look up the story of Monroe Bergdorf. Um, Monroe Bergdorf is a trans woman who uh, is a model, but is also very outspoken in terms of uh, trans and black issues. And she got a job with, I can't remember which particular um, cosmetics company took her on, um, but they took her on as a sort of ambassador for all about a month or maybe even a week. And she was monstered by the press because she had the temerity to come out and talk about white racism and structural racism. And that was it. She was gone. Now, she's come back because briefly Black Lives Matter was fashionable in the press. But that's what is done. If you don't speak respectively, then you are toast. And what this goes back to is this thing about individuals are protected. What is very interesting to me is just who these people are forever going on about free speech. They want free speech to be able to say whatever they want about Roma, about trans people, about black people, Muslims. They want the free speech to say what the hell they want. And yet the moment I or Marvina or, or Natalie fire back, they've got the libel rules to shut us down. So I recognize exactly, Marvina, this thing about I have to be checking all the time what I say in what I write, in what I say on public platforms, just in case somebody with a very large salary and a, and a sense of, I don't know, arrogant pride decides to bring me down. In the end, it's about taking apart and either taking libel away as a weapon for these people, so they can't do you for libel, or putting into law something which says that if you um, go after a group, that's as bad as libel. One or the other. Let's put some balance back in the system. That's my solution. Wow. Um, I'm just going to say, um... I like using this solution all the time. Let's just be better allies. Both journalists, whether you're in the media, whether you're not in the media, let's try this. A to act. Act when you see those inequality. You see it on the news, you see it on the written press, act on it. Let's make sure we know how to not be silenced when we see that. When you see something that you think it's not right, this is a lie, gather some people, start a petition, get something done. The other thing is the L is to listen. Listen to those voices that are oppressed. Listen actively, not to respond, but to also the other L, to learn. Learn and unlearn your conscious or unconscious bias. This works for those in the press right now. So I'm assuming some of the press people are gonna watch this. So this is to help you be a better human being. It's not that hard, but hopefully this helps. But this also works for also people that just don't know what to do. Being an ally to all the different communities, when you see it, it might not matter to you because you're thinking it's black people's issue, it's not my problem. Well, what's not your problem today might be your problem tomorrow. So it's better for you to start acting on it when you see it. Learn, learn, learn. And the why is to yield. Yield your power and privilege. Be able to know how to position yourself in a way to always give space for those who are marginalized. If you think about it, if you're in a position of power and you've got some privilege, who is missing out of the conversation? Who is not in the room? Whose stories are not being told? For the journalists or the young people who are up and coming in the media industry, think about this. What stories are not being written? Think about the traveler communities. Think about the women in the traveling communities. Think about those. That's how you create pieces that are memorable because other people don't want to do the work. Do the work, tell the truth. That's how you create that. The last thing is to decolonize the press. Decolonize the press. Make sure you go in there and you think about what is missing from this. Who are the historical Sheroes, heroes, deros who come from marginalized and minority co community. 
and decolonize the economy because that's where you need to hit them where it is you know and this is why i love what's going on with money rebellion by decolonizing the economy you you hit them where their money is and they they don't respect anything about apart from capitalism so you need to be able to say hey you have no power right now because the people are not going to be buying your newspaper or not going to be clicking on your online platform we're boycotting you and i think that's the solution to boycott them them ones that are doing these things i don't pay tv license because i'm not giving bbc any extra money just because they tell so much lies so that's because i could find a way around it and there's a way around everything but just try and start and the last bit is for us in the community let's start helping each other tell our own stories to unpick the lies they've told us about ourselves so what lies have they told us about exa what lies have they told us about trans community what lies have they told us about blm let's start talking to each other and helping each other write our own narratives that's something we could do tomorrow hopefully you all have enjoyed this so i really appreciate this hopefully this helps and get children to write their own stories and become media children are amazing they don't tell no lies literally they will just tell you as it is and it hurts so let's try teaching our children to start and young people how to write their own narratives every day that's me <laughs> thank you so brilliant you've all spoken so amazingly thank you so much um i think we need to close there we've run a little bit over time there's so much more we could say um so thank you jane natalie marvina thank you to our viewers at home i hope you've enjoyed our brilliant discussion and that you'll find something that you can take forward um just a final note from me if i may um we've known about the corrupt criminal divisive press in this country for a long time and things are only getting worse time for action and our panelists have mentioned numerous ways of addressing these issues we can do together what we're talking about here what we've all been talking about um, although it seems very varied and we've talked about so many issues what we're talking about is salvaging the very fabric of our democracy about building a society that is united enough compassionate enough informed enough to survive what's coming and the clock is ticking so on the 27th of June Join us in London as we come together to free the press. All the details are on our website and social media. I'll be there. I hope you will too. We'll see you on the streets. Thank you.